Well, hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall here from Stonehenge to Row with, along with Kay. Hello. And, uh, <laughs> and, we've all, and we've also got Keith on board, as you can see as well, okay? And uh, we thought for today, uh, talking about everyone being talking about Matariki, all right? And what, so we, what we thought we might talk about is what this star cluster was all about where did that tradition actually come from and actually look at the uh, stars themselves as physical bodies as it were all right so that's what the plan is today okay so let's start off by going backwards in time and looking at uh, our ancestors and i think because we live in a world of technology where we've got information at our fingertips all the time we tend to forget what it would have been like thousands of years ago before that, that information was available you know and i mean both things like navigation and timekeeping but these things like timekeeping for example was absolutely vital for our ancestors to survive you sail at the wrong time you never came back you had to know when was the time to sail when do you plant your seeds you know if you look at the weather we've had would you know what month we're in if you would never seen a calendar right so this sort of information was absolutely vital and out at Stonehenge, of course, uh, we've, one of the most important things about the structure of the Stonehenge, it tells you exactly when all these important s seasonal changes are about to take place. Okay? So in short, Stonehenge is almost like a um, combination clock and calendar and computer. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But there was always, yeah, there's also a spiritual side to it and so on. But what, um, in the ancient world, and to this day, there were four special days which marked major turning points in the climate and then and therefore turning points in the tasks of the people. As I always point out at Stonehenge these days, most people do the same job throughout the year, but not so in the past, right? They would have these different tasks that they would carry out. And on these four days when the um, two solstices, solstices and the two equinoxes, right? Now solstice means the sun standing still, right? We often call these the longest and the shortest day. Uh, referring to the hours of daylight and the reason why it's called this sun standing still for those uh, our ancestors of course would have noticed it the rise and set position of the sun is continually moving along the horizon but at the time of solstice it stops moving and turns around and goes back so this is the point at the horizon where the sun rises every morning yeah. and day by day week by week month by month that point shifts that's right yeah, yes that's right yes. uh the other two days of course are the two equinoxes now equinox means equal day equal night and it's when the sun is above the horizon for exactly 12 hours around the world and it is incidentally the only days of the year when the sun rises due east and sets due west the interesting thing is about the sun moving along the horizon is this sort of thing is only accurate as long as you're viewing it from exactly the same place. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that gives rise to, you know, um, observation points which become observatories of various sorts, even in ancient times. I mean, Stonehenge is an observatory. Mm, absolutely. Mm. And, and the thing is that um, when people come out to Stonehenge and so on, they, they wonder how like similar it is for example the stonehenge in britain or another one somewhere else around the world the answer is only roughly because each one has to be designed for its specific spot on the earth otherwise right. it doesn't work because you've got a view from that particular spot absolutely yeah. and see those events along usually along the horizon yeah. we've got hill stones but in ancient times you were often looking at a range of hills yeah and it was certain points on that that yeah. you yeah. noticed yeah. or yeah. the shaft of the sunlight at a particular time and of course the other thing people often ask me about so when they built the stone circle you know and i said well originally what we do know is long before the river stone circle was built there were wooden circles and these mm. wooden posts were put down from an observational spot which you could observe these exact moments when they, the seasons were going to change and so on and then later they were replaced by stones right that's the way in which we know it now works anyway these four days became the original holy days and that is where your word holiday comes from because no one worked on a holy day and what you will find is that just about every major religious festival in the world from culture to culture is identified with a solstice or an equinox and we celebrate them to this day except most people don't realize that it's actually 
that you know, particular day is actually to do with the solstice or an equinox. And a good example would be uh, December the 25th, which you immediately identify as Christmas Day, right? But in, actually, in actual fact, in the days of the Roman Empire, that was the date of the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. Yes. And there was a great festival held throughout the empire and beyond that, all right? Now, you know all this sort of uh, giving presents away and things like that, like that. Well, that goes actually back to that particular uh, time, back in the winter solstice, back in those times, all right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but incidentally, it was a date adopted by Augustine, I think in 325 AD. Uh, he adopted that to celebrate the birth of Christ. Now, that's not when Jesus was born, right? <laughs> it's, the ancient, it's the ancient pagan festival of the winter solstice. But of course, uh, after a while, people get into the idea, that's the actual day on which it occurred, but of course it's not. Yes. Yeah. It's rather like confusion with uh, what used to be Queen's birthday, and it's yeah. now King's birthday. He yeah. wasn't actually born that particular exactly. day. Exactly. Yes. Uh, but after a while, people get to the idea, that's the actual <laughs> day on which it occurred, when it's actually not. Yeah. Yeah. So... And so we find all these important days. Now, the, I guess the most important day of the year for most cultures, particularly in the ancient world, was the spring equinox. And we're going back to the northern hemisphere here. Mm. It marked the return of life on Earth following the harsh northern hemisphere winter, the restoration of food supplies, the lambing season. This was truly a time to celebrate. It was the beginning of very hard work. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I can remember, I come coming from England and, that, and I tell you what, you go through some of the bitterly cold winters there and remember your ancestors couldn't go down the shop and get some tucker when they needed it. All they had was what there's already stored, your food would be running out. So when that, that time came when the, the, you know, the cold weather would begin to disappear and the, you, know, you could plant and stuff would grow, it was all It's a important. tricky time now because you also tend to get late frosts and things. So mm. you find in a lot of these ancient cultures mm. there are also ways of predicting um, that you were about to get a frost that day, yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, <laughs> so, but this 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 great festival we know in the Western world as Easter, all right? Now, if you've been brought up in a Christian society, you probably almost identify immediately identify Easter as a Christian festival. But as I always say to people, what have Easter eggs and Easter bunnies got to do with it? <laughs> And the answer is nothing, you see, because people have been celebrating Easter thousands of years before the coming of Christianity. And I think you can probably all remember as kids painting little eggs. Yes. You've all yes. done that. Yeah. yeah. It's such a big tradition. I don't know if people realise that's a tradition going back thousands and thousands of years. Okay. And the word Easter comes from Eostri, who was the Teutonic, uh, Teutonic goddess of fertility. Right? And the Easter eggs were her gift to people because the hens started laying again after the harsh winter and the Easter bunny, and that's her symbol of fertility, okay? Yes, because, because rabbits breed like rabbits. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and uh, hey folks, and I should uh, uh, remind you a couple of other things, how things get misinterpreted. I'd love to have a room full of people and say, okay, um, how many of you are pagans? <laughs> and everyone, no one puts up their hand. I said, anyone here live in the countryside? And they all put up their hand and said, well, you are pagan, yeah. you see. Because the word pagan comes from paganus, which means country folk. It's the same as a villain. You've heard of villains? Yes. People who live in a village. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, a village, you're, you're a villain. <laughs> it might be true. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But this all comes up when Christianity spread throughout Europe. They could, they had their powers in the cities they could tur turn those into christians but they not the pagans and villains out there who carried it over on in the old way so yes. <laughs> we're thinking thinking about that so now as i said the spring equinox was the most important day of the year right but long before stone circles were built people needed to know when the spring equinox was actually going to occur and i'm going to take you back now five thousand years in time and we know that there's what we call the four pillars of heaven. And these are actually, for those of you watching this on TV, you can see an Egyptian monteith up there. Uh, and you can see... That's the four, Dendara. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you can see the four pillars they're standing up there. And these four pillars mark four important times, okay? They are mark the equinoxes and solstices. And there are four bright stars. And these four bright stars mark 
where the sun is at the time of the solstice and the equinox. So for the autumn equinox, we've got Antares, the bright star in Scorpius. Fomalhaut, all right, there, uh, marking the winter solstice, all right, that's in Aquarius. The spring equinox is all Devalan uh, in Taurus the Bull. And the summer solstice is marked by Regulus in the constellation of Leo. Now, the most important of these in the ancient world was the spring equinox, and that was Aldebaran. But, of course, you couldn't see it, because when the sun was next to Aldebaran in the sky, that would be daytime. But what our ancestors could see was this. As the sun moved to Aldebaran, the tip of the bull's tail came above the horizon. Right? And that tip of the bull's tail is Matariki. The well, seven sisters. It's up the other way in the northern yeah, hemisphere. Yeah, that's right. There's the seven sisters then, mm. which mark the four pillars of heaven. All right. And so this was a tradition right the way around the world that they were looking for. And you've got to remember if a group of stars rises up at a certain time, marking a major time change in the climate, that is going to be important to people around the world. Yes. Again, you have to remember this. This is as important to ancient people as um, knowing the financial reports of today. Um, it's quite critical to your survival yeah. to know these things, and this is why there was so much emphasis put on things such as the um, the rising of the uh, rising of Matariki or yeah. the Pleiades. Don't let's yes. don't let's relate these to financial reports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it, you know, we 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 have, we have the same yeah. need for that information. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So from about five thousand years ago, the rising of the seven sisters, which is Batariki, okay, held the new year for people around the world. They also marked the opening of the sea lanes. So at this point, trade would begin. Right? And this uh, is this is probably confined to the world and the northern hemisphere and things like that when Absolutely. you're talking about yep. the world yeah. although you know it, it later on with travel it becomes southern as well and we always tend to think things have always been as they are but in fact up into 17 uh i think no 1754 something like that the new year in britain for example began not at the first of january but in the ides of march yeah we all know equinox. we all know poor old caesar got yeah. done in on the Ides of March. That's right, yeah. Mm. That's right. And it was, it was that important. Uh, but we, this is cr all these sorts of things, of course, create en enormous problems for historians. Mm. Because when you find an ancient manuscript and it says this has happened on so-and-so's date, whose calendar they're using? It almost certainly is not ours, all right? So you have to go back and try and find out which calendar they were using and so on and so forth. And you have to reset the sky to what they were looking at. That's right, yeah. Mm. That's right. Okay, so what happened is these stars are also known uh, for, for navigation reasons as the hen and chicks, the sailor stars. Because when they came up, it was safe for the sailors to take the ships out and uh, trade across the world. Then four and a half thousand years ago, the migrations into the Pacific began. And those people took these traditions with them. So to this day, down here in Aotearoa, uh, we say the rising of the seven sisters, Matariki, marks the beginning of the new year, or is the herald of the new year. Right? Mm. And Matariki incidentally means little eyes. Yeah, a lot of, because the, the stars just seem to be um, forever, a lot of cultures can, contain some reference to the fact that their ancestors are represented by stars or are the eyes of the star of the ancestors looking down on them mm. Mm. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. now uh, shall we carry on or do you want to play us a little tune we will you pass a tune at the end oh we can do that at the end if you like okay yes. okay so because i'm fascinated by what you're saying <laughs> here. yes <laughs> well okay so let's have a look at these stars themselves uh for those of you watching on tv because it's beautiful photograph and it is a photograph of the of these it's not what you can see with the unaided eye. That, that beautiful uh, nebulosity around them is something you can only see in either a very big telescope or when you photograph. 
So let's have a look at what the stars and the stars, these particular stars are about themselves, okay? So, first of all, they're not visible in the sky at the moment. You have to get up early in the morning to have a look at them. And uh, on our star chart, we're looking due north. And if you look due north in the early morning, just before the onset of dawn, you will see the, the great square there. It's dead easy to pick out, all right? And rising up in the northeast is Matariki, all right? This is, this is another instance in, in Māori astronomy. Some of the um, Alston Best refers to the Māori that he talked to, talking about the hot stars and the cold stars. If you get up in the early morning to see Matariki, you will realise why they call them cold stars. <laughs> and when you get up in November, well, you get up in November, you look in the evening sky, which is nice and warm, you can see them as hot stars. That's right, yeah. Okay, so let's have a closer look. Right now, they're called uh, the seven. We know them as the seven sisters. Um, they're known as the Pleiades from Europe, and that's really the main astronomy tends to use those it's terms. The it's, it's, name. Yeah, it's yes. the default yes. name. Um, Japan, Shibaru. Yeah, that was four um, four car companies that combined together to make Subaru or yeah. Subaru, and that um, is why. The Pleiades are on the, you know, on cars, their cars. That's, that's yes, yeah. And then, then you've got in India, they're known as Kritika, okay, which is um, represented as one, one of the great gods there, doesn't it? I'm not too yeah, sure of that yeah. one, Richard. And of course, in, in, in known as uh, Matariki in Polynesia, okay. So, but anyway, to look at the traditions, we have to go back to what they looked like long, long time ago to the Northern Hemisphere, all right? And each of the seven sisters has got a name, all right? So we'll bring them up. There's Elcione there, Merope, Electra, Maya, Sterope, Tegeta, and Seleno, all right? Those are the seven sisters, okay? But if you look at this, there's two other brights, at least two other bright stars that you can see. Well, because um, some people say, well, well, I can see more than seven sisters. I can see nine. Well, with the unaided eye, you'll see anywhere between about four, five, and mm -hmm. nine stars. I tend to see uh, between five and six. Yeah, yeah. On, just, good, on just, a good night, a naked yeah, eye. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But the other two bright stars are actually is mum and dad, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so there's the seven sisters looking at them. And then we've got mum and dad there, okay? And the brightest, of course, has to be dad, right? Is Atlas. I'm getting a bit of a skewed look there from Kay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Atlas, of course, who held up the world, and his wife is Pleione, all right? And she was a titaness. And um, what I can tell you is Pleione is very, very special to me, okay? Because when I first became involved in astronomy, long, long ago, when I was a teenager or something like that, when I really began to get involved in it, Back in the mists of time. Uh, yes, I know. And I <laughs> and I became uh, joined the the, Inter uh, the British Astronomical Society, and also the Variable Star Section. And this star, Pleione, was one of the first I used to observe because she changes in brightness. Mm. Unlike most stars, which remain the same, she keeps changing in brightness. Maybe okay. that's why she's female. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so now for those of you watching this TV, you can see here the cluster it is now. Watch what will happen. This is what happens every now and again. Boom. Suddenly, Pleione brightens, and so she's as bright as, or even brighter than Atlas, right? And then she fades away again. Bear Boom. that in Both, mind, yeah. all men. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So what was going on here? And I, I used to, I used nothing more than a pair of binoculars. I used to record how often this used to occur, when it occurred, and so on. So you can actually see that change in brightness through uh, binoculars. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. quite, it's quite noticeable. Mm. And once you get used to it, you know, you're used to that Pleione being obviously half the brightness of Atlas, yes. and suddenly warmer. You know. Now, what is the reason for uh, Pleione's change in brightness? Well, what we have learned since that time, uh, as I looked out, it, it's it's a hot star. All right? Its distance, as I put up here, is 440 light years, all right? and it's 231 times brighter than the sun. Mm. But it is also rotating very, very rapidly. 
In fact, it's rotating so rapidly, if it rotated much faster, it would disintegrate. And it ejects, every now and again, you get enormous eruptions on the surface of the star, which then throws stuff out into space, all right? Sure. And that's what you're seeing, is these big eruptions that are taking place on side, on side of this star. Yes. So, so these variations in brightness, they are, they're regular? No. They're not. They're not. No. Right. No. So sometimes when we look at a star, some stars are what we call variable stars. They pulsate, and often they can be very regular. But th this eruptive star, no, it's, it doesn't seem to be any pattern. It can go for ages, and bang, it happens, and yes. then it can go again in a week's so it's time. it's unpredictable. Yeah, it is unpredictable. Yes. And that's what we discovered from the observations that I and others made of that star. Mm. Uh, you know, the pattern. Back in the, your teens. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. In the eighteen nineties. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be <laughs> young teens. They're about the seventeenth century, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing for, to learn from that is that everybody can be involved in some important discoveries. It's just a matter of being really, really consistent and watching for a long time and recording. Well yes. when I was okay, when I was back in England, you know, when I was young, uh I mean, all I, I couldn't afford a telescope or I had a pair of binoculars. So I was amazed at the amount of things I could see and the work I could do with just a pair of binoculars and also mm. working with other people. Yeah, so the answer is, yeah, there's a yeah, lot. Yeah, you can start from scratch yeah. and still make a really good contribution. Yeah, because oh, the universe is so big, there's always something new mm. to, to learn and so on. Yeah, okay. So now you can see why Pleione is so important to me, okay, to this mm. day, okay. She's rather good looking, isn't she? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's turned around. <laughs> yes. She looks rather alluring. Okay, yes. and I always call this the Jurassic Star Cluster, right? The cluster, as I said, is 444 light years away, and it contains over 800 stars. Now, this means that these stars, by a cluster, they're actually physically bound together, and this is because they were formed together. Now, if we take the same region of space near the sun, right, we find there's only a tenth the number of stars. Right? All stars are formed in clusters, but eventually, with the passage of time, they disintegrate. And when we look at the seven sisters, or the nine bright stars there, we're just seeing the brightest stars in this cluster of hundreds and hundreds of stars. Its radius, as I said, is 17 light years. Right? Oh. And its age is 115 a million uh, years, which if takes us back to the Jurassic period, all right? So if you were living at the same time as the dust dinosaurs in the Jurassic period, you could have witnessed the birth of this star cluster, okay? Yes. And indeed, we see them, right, way, way back in time as well, okay? Because so, of their distance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Now, that, that haze around them is actually nebulosity, is gas and dust, which is simply reflecting the blue light of the brighter stars. Mm -hmm. And it's quite extensive. I'm showing you on TV here, different images done through big telescopes looking at it in detail. It looks quite stirred up, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it used to be believed that this stuff was the raw material from which uh, these stars were formed, but it turns out no. Mm. The cluster simply collided with a gas cloud and it's illuminating it, right? So that's the way in which that is working. Back in, to... back in my teens, in about the 18th century or whatever, <laughs> back in my teens when I first saw a, an astrophotograph of the uh, Pleiades or Matariki um, in a book, I thought they made a mistake and they'd actually smeared out the uh, the, 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 uh, the yeah. photo when they like when bad they bad photography <laughs> exactly when they printed it yeah. and uh, then of course I had to read the re, you know read 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 the explanation yeah. and as you say it does look like these stars are actually moving yeah. through a cloud. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. Now, the bright, just to finish up by talking about the brightest star in the group at all is Alcyone, all right? And it is, in fact, a binary star, two stars orbiting around each other, all right? And uh, they're very, very hot. And there are actually three other stars that are with them as well. So it's actually a cluster of itself, five bound stars. And the total out energy output of the Alcyone is 2,030 times that wow. of the sun. And that's why it's so bright, right? that's, that distance. Yeah, um, That's powerful. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, so there you are. That's what the Seven Sisters is actually all about and where Matariki initiated from. Okay. Now, just briefly, before we get uh, a little bit of music, just to mention to you that Stonehenge is open. Uh, weekends at the moment from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., all right? 
and uh, there's guided tours and also we can take you a tour of the stars as well if you want to do that but they have to be booked okay okay so anything to add Kay? Um, no, we're okay. just looking forward to seeing you because one of the great joys of running Stonehenge out here uh, is meeting all the people who come in and chatting yes. to them. Right, Keith is going to finish off a little bit of music. Yeah, well, in celebration of Matariki, um, I'm, I'm uh, not Māori myself, but um, I do have a fascination for the Māori instrument called the koao. Um, I uh, forgive my incorrect pronunciation, but the koao is the um, little flute that the Māori are quite famous for. I've got my Irish whistle here, and i uh, play a little piece that incorporates the warble or the vibrato of playing the koao. So this is what it sounds like. So there you have it. That's the celebration of Matariki. Okay, folks. Thanks for listening. And we'll be, we'll be back in two weeks from, from now um, with some more things about the stars. But remember, <laughs> go out and have a look at Matariki. Yes. That means and now you know them. where to look for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah.